As we get set up, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to come here today to take, talk a little bit about emerging food allergies. And as you can imagine, this is a topic that we could probably spend the better part of a couple days discussing. So with that, um, we're going to put some of the context around some case studies that we see as far as uh, some emerging allergens and what we should think about in the context of how we evaluate those and really uh, probably going to open up the discussion and probably bring up more questions and providing results today and, and direction forward. But I hope this triggers that discussion because it is definitely needed as we go through uh, thinking about the context of putting new foods into our diets as we have uh, new complexities going on in regards to protein sources in our diets. So by way of disclosures, um, I do direct the Food Allergy Research and Resource Program at the University of Nebraska. We do rely upon support from the food industry to help with our research and outreach programs. Uh, we also get funding from USDA, and I've contributed to some of the immunotherapy uh, areas, uh, specifically with DBV technologies. So I won't belabor this point, as we all know, allergens are a public health concern, uh, both here uh, in westernized countries, but it seems to be merging elsewhere. And if we take the context of looking at just the U.S. for a moment, we have estimates, although prevalence is difficult to judge. Uh, we have studies that suggest perhaps 6 to 8% of children are allergic, and even perhaps up to 10% of adults, based on uh, some studies that were published last year uh, by the group at Northwestern. So it is an emerging area of public health concern, certainly. We do know those reactions can be quite severe on occasion, uh, and so they are preventable with that avoidance. But as Jamie nicely uh, relayed, that avoidance is easier said than done as we think about how we go about uh, having a diet of various foods uh, and going through that daily life with the, trying to avoid various allergens. Small, act uh, small amounts can cause a reaction, and you'll hear more about thresholds in the context of peanut allergy, but there is emerging data so we can begin to understand what exactly do we mean by small amounts uh, causing those reactions, and what does that look like on an overall population basis as we consider uh, various risk management approaches. Of course, there's no cure currently, uh, but there are active areas of research that are looking at immunotherapy approaches, even prevention approaches that might have totality in the future, but are still ongoing from that research perspective. And certainly we know that this does have a public health burden on families, and we always have to remember that it's the allergic individuals and families that are really struggling with uh, that day-to-day -day, um, quality of life with food allergens. A study by Northwestern did look at the cost of having food allergies in that family dynamic, where it was estimated around $5,000 per family uh, was attributed to various things with managing that food allergy. Whether that was lost wages because a parent stayed home, uh, not uh, fully trusting that their child would be safe at a daycare or an institutional setting, or uh, management and dietary restrictions and so forth. So when we think about food allergens in a broad context, you know, if we think about lunch that we're going to have next, we're going to consume probably thousands of individual proteins from plant and animal sources uh, in our diet, and we do that on a daily basis. But a limited number of those proteins from a limited number of food sources, perhaps, uh, have the uh, propensity to cause a higher prevalence of food allergy in the population. So there's critical factors that we still need to consider or better understand uh, about what factors are involved in that sensitization. What triggers uh, my immune system to view a, for a protein from a nutritional source of food as a foreign invader and attacks that, wants to remove that protein? And then even when we look at the allergen sources themselves, we know that there are some proteins that are more allergenic uh, than others. So there are differences. So can we begin to define those differences?
I like to show this slide by Scott Sisher and Hugh Sampson that really sums up uh, what we probably don't know about sensitization. There's a lot of things that probably contribute and are multifactorial in nature. So as Jamie mentioned, perhaps exposure from the skin of abraded infants that have that exposure route could cause sensitization perhaps. There could be environmental exposures, differences in the way we consume foods uh, compared to the uh, how we used to traditionally consume foods. Perhaps processed foods might have a difference in that allergen response, uh, where we begin to change that protein profile, perhaps, could contribute. Now notice I'm saying may or could contribute, because I don't know that we have a lot of information in all contexts to really understand what triggers that immune response. Now certainly we know that um, through studies that early exposure seems to be a critical factor in building that tolerance, uh, but yet there's work to be done there as well. So when we look at those proteins from allergenic sources, uh, often we hear about the big eight allergens, those eight predominant allergen sources that were defined by Codex as probably accounting for about 90% of food allergens, uh, allergic reactions that uh, back in 1995 when that panel was assembled. Now, when we look at those allergens or allergenic sources, certainly it's the naturally occurring proteins that are the key for that uh, allergic reaction, the key sensitizers in that case. Um, they tend to have some uh, similarities when we look across various proteins, but not all of those allergenic proteins are created equal. So we do see that we have some uh, proteins that are more heat resistant. They can uh, withstand heat processing in various ways. So that might mean that they might uh, denature in a sense. So you have that folded structure, which I'll show here in a little bit. They might denature, they might unfold, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're uh, rendered um, non-immunologically active or still maintain that allergenicity. Heat might also cause those to aggregate, so you get protein aggregation, uh, but again, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that protein's rendered non-allergenic. Resistance to proteolysis, so digestion and extremes in pH and so forth, uh, tend to have little effect on these proteins, and we'll talk about uh, evaluation of proteolysis or digestion here in a moment as well. Um, some allergens, uh, allergenic sources, tend to have uh, a variety of proteins that can trigger the immune system, uh, where we see many of the major protein sources, especially from seed storage proteins, um, contributing to that allergic response. So often they're highly abundant proteins, so your immune system will have the opportunity to have a large degree of exposure to those foods. And we can see a variety of different uh, proteins that can cause reactions uh, with some individual sources having multiple allergens. So peanut has perhaps 12 to 14 characterized allergens, uh, some of which cause more predominantly cause allergen in the population and others are more minor allergens. And then we have others that might have a single allergen or a few allergens that are predominant with that allergic re response. Certainly, if we look across the world in different reg uh, regulatory jurisdictions, there are differences in labeling laws based upon regional differences uh, of the pre pre predominant food allergens that they see in those regions. And that's probably due to different exposures of those different allergens. Uh, so again, that exposure is critical for those allergen sources. I like to point to Japan, for example, where on their list they have buckwheat as a predominant allergen. That priority allergen is there because they have um, more buckwheat in their diet compared to what we see elsewhere in the world. Now, if we took buckwheat and translated that uh, and consumed it similarly elsewhere, would that cause a similar response and prevalence of buckwheat allergen? And that question remains largely unknown. So that really brings us to the essence of the discussion that I was tasked with today is how can we predict whether a novel food source will be allergenic? And again, easier said than done. But what framework could we consider as we begin to think about uh, bringing in new food sources?
we do have some tools available, and I'll talk about some of that weight of evidence-based approach that we can consider as we think about bringing in new, new food sources. Sometimes it's not necessarily a new food source, but it's a novel ingredient from a known uh, food source that's been known to be safe. So think about protein concentrates and isolates, perhaps, as an extension of a novel food source that we've had. So if we look at 2020, where are we at today with novel foods? And this very uh, limited snapshot, in my mind, of where we see different uh, novel food sources coming about. So we have various uh, plant-based novel foods. And again, think about these in novel food applications, ingredients, perhaps. So we have various legume or pulse sources that are commonly utilized. And we've had these in our diets for, uh, for years and years. We're looking at pea, chickpea, lupin, others that, again, in their native forms, have been utilized in various food sources. But now we see an emergence of a high protein trend, uh, perhaps in the US, US and elsewhere, where we're trying to bring in foods that have a higher protein um, profile to capitalize on some of those nutritional uh, benefits. So you might see pea protein isolates, 90 or so percent protein from pea, concentrates roughly 60 plus percent protein from that source. How does that change that profile from what we see from that native and uh, what's been characterized as a safe food? Algae is a good example as well where we see an emergence of various algal type proteins. We've had GM based crops and uh, they're, uh, very, uh, they're abundant in some jurisdictions in, throughout the world. There is a, con a framework by which we've evaluated those GM crops. Um, that kind of gives us that framework for how we could potentially think about evaluation of um, novel food sources. Insects is another emerging area where we're looking at high protein products from things like crickets, mealworms, ants, termites, some others that again bring us about that high protein profile in lieu of perhaps animal proteins. So, uh, cultured meat cells bacterial and fungal cells and uh, protein products, all uh, different areas that are being considered uh, for novel food sources or already in our um, food supply. So what are the possible risks? Thinking about food allergens in this context, perhaps celiac disease, we'll expand upon that discussion. So if we think about novel food regulations, uh, a lot of these were based upon um, the use of the GM assessment, kind of that codex framework that looked at GM assessment as a general guideline. Um, so we've adopted some of those in certain regulations where we've looked at kind of, again, that weight of evidence-based approach. So if we think about some of the critical factors in assessing a GM crop would be, is the protein from a known allergen? We can use bioinformatics and literature-based searches to evaluate uh, whether or not it's from an allergenic source. Well, from that context for GM assessment, that makes sense. We don't want to insert a gene from a known allergen. But if we're thinking about a novel food, and I'll use pea as a good example throughout my talk, again, pea is um, a very safe source of food traditionally. So what you're seeing is, if I ask this question, is there protein that's a known allergen from pea, for example? We know already that if you look, there might be a very low prevalence of allergic individuals to, that have pea allergy. Does that mean that we should stop our innovation at that juncture? Uh, again, we could look at serum testing of IgE and some other factors that could evaluate that further. Is, protein, is the protein nearly identical uh, to an allergen or potentially cross-reactive. So again, we might search a database and find an allergen from that source. So then the key question is, is that cross-reactive perhaps to other known allergens from a botanical family that are more prevalent allergens? So pea is a legume, so the question could be how close uh, or do we, would we expect cross-reactivity from peanut, for example, or soybean, for example? Will consumption of pea lead to the 
pain, well, consumption of the protein lead to elicitation or sensitation. So I think, again, if we dig deep enough into the literature, we're going to find that someone out there perhaps uh, has published a case report on some of these uh, novel areas of foods. So I think we would find that there could be uh, individuals out there. But again, does that stop the innovation at that point? Thinking about the stability of proteins. So let's set aside the novel source and think about a novel ingredient. So if we begin to think about different uh, protein isolations uh, and characterization of those proteins, uh, is there differences in what the, uh, fraction of the proteins that we've isolated um, that may make a difference in that stability profile, that digestive profile, perhaps the abundance as well? So we can look at various tools that we have, again, primarily developed for develop evaluation of GM assessment and safety assessment in that realm, but could be utilized as a tool or at least give us some, some information for novel food sources. So we can look at protein family structural characteristics uh, using databases that allow us to look at amino acid sequence homology, how closely uh, those proteins from one source may be to a, a priority allergen, such as peanut, for example, and maybe begin to assess cross-reactivity. We can also look at protein family, those structural characteristics, and how closely related some of those structural char characteristics may be. So things such as allergen online compare databases uh, have been assembled to look at uh, known allergens that have been reported for uh, allergic reactions. So again, these databases have an abundance of protein uh, sources that have gone through a rigid uh, inclusion criterion to show that there might be IgE binding to certain proteins. Uh, there might be clinical workup and further diagnostics that allow you to say that it's a proven allergen, for example. So again, if we look at that database of you know, somewhere around uh, about 2,000 individual database uh, proteins, there's probably an, a good opportunity that you'll have a protein from a novel food source in that uh, database. But again, does that mean you should not move forward with that innovation? You could look at, additionally, some of the taxonomic relationships. So again, trying to think about could there be that potential for cross-reactivity? So utilizing things such as the taxonomy browsers, some of the PFAM, some of the other uh, available tools that allow us to look at structural components. Um, Allergome as well is an excellent one that uses some of the Uniprot data. Uh, but again, when you look at trying to think about um, structure com comparative to different proteins, you're going to see similarities. But does that translate to clinical reactivity or clinical cross-reactivity? So if we utilize the protein families, uh, we know that uh, there are a grouping of different allergens that tend, and those families that tend to be uh, pri priority allergens. So if we look at many of the plant food allergens, you see some similarities in uh, the prevalence of different things such as proline, prolamines, BET-B1s, cupins, uh, and some others that tend to have uh, a number of proteins that in these families across different food sources that can cause or have been reported as allergens in some of these databases. So again, that might, if you have a, a cupin, for example, in a different uh, sources of legumes, that could mean that you might see some cross-reactivity, but it's again not 100% uh, predictive. Same thing with animal foods. Uh, we do see that there are allergens uh, primarily in three predominant uh, protein families, the tropomyosins, EF hands, casein type proteins, but again, that doesn't necessarily mean they're always gonna see cross-reactivity amongst those species. In instances where we do see cross-reactivity, uh, I'll give the example of pecan and walnut, very cr closely related. If I do a sequence evaluation of some of the predominant proteins, we'll probably see that there's 70% uh, homology 
some of the proteins probably 90% homology. So in many individuals, if they're allergic to pecan, they're also going to react to walnut. So there's pretty high probability. You also see that clinically it's been reported about this cross-reactivity. Uh, pistachio and cashew are another excellent example of those that uh, have been shown to be cross-reactive in that very closely related botanical family. But there's other ones that we wouldn't think about. And I give the example of pink peppercorn. So if those that are, aren't familiar, the pink peppercorns and often those grinder shakers are derived from a family that are uh, the same family within cashew and pistachio. Now with that, there are reports of cross-reactivity that have been published now in the UK uh, documenting that cross-reactive potential. But we don't know how much might be needed to trigger that cross-reactive uh, reactivity that we see. There's others that, you know, again, I mentioned legumes being a very broad group of, of different proteins. If I look at the legume, legume sources across that we commonly consume, we have peanuts, soybeans, peas, chickpeas, and a whole host of different ones that are in this very broad classification of legumes. If we look structurally, we're going to see some of those same protein families, but yet clinically we often don't see a lot of reactivity amongst the cross-reactivity amongst these different sources. Um, however, we are hearing about some reactions to the high protein forms of these different food sources. Protein stability, as I mentioned, um, those proteins that don't digest readily uh, or only partially digest and leave largely intact peptides um, could be key targets that uh, the immune system can react to as they're going to remain, remain stable in the system and the immune system has opportunity to interact. So there are some things that we can look at when we're evaluating different proteins and their stability. Things like disulfide bonds, where we see extensive disulfide bonding causing that bridge that really provides that stability amongst various proteins. Again, could be a trigger uh, for uh, the cross-reactivity. Uh, could be also, again, that stability for the immune system to react to. Immunological analysis is also another step in the process commonly used for GM assessment. Now here I show some, a study that was done in 1996 uh, at our group in, at uh, the University of Nebraska in which this was really the, really the hallmark study that got GM safety assessment started. Um, in this case, there was a gene insert into soybean. That gene uh, came from Brazil nut and happened to encode uh, what we later found to be the predominant uh, 2S albumin um, from Brazil nut, and that would have been placed into soybean. And had that not stopped that innovation at the time, you would have seen soy allergic individuals uh, or Brazil nut allergic individuals reacting to soybean because that uh, very stable protein was going to be inserted. So some of the things that we looked at during that study was IgE binding, so taking IgE from Brazil nut allergic individuals, doing western blots, seeing the binding that took place um, in both the control, the, the Brazil nut, as well as uh, the GM soy crop in that case. So again, we had pretty good evidence there. You could take that to skin prick testing to evaluate uh, the uh, in vivo reactivity. Um, and you could also do things such as inhibition plots and so forth. But again, if you rely on only one of these, you may have uh, some questions. So this is a pretty, pretty clear cut case in which we saw a uh, binding to that uh, offending protein. But sometimes when you take uh, IgE or sera from allergic individuals, you might see a whole host of different things that IgE is recognizing, but not, might not be clinically relevant in that case. So sometimes we'll see binding to uh, cross-reactive carbohydrate determinants, or CCDs, that have questionable um, clinical relevance, but again, you have to use that weight of evidence, not looking at just one individual evaluation. Thinking about sensitization, it's a complex topic where we're looking at 
how an individual becomes sensitized versus how others become tolerant and what are those key uh, aspects in the immune system. So again, trying to fit um, one evaluation system into a single box is quite challenging. And again, using a GM assessment approach, that weight of evidence, may or may not fit for novel foods in some contexts. We also have to think about a dose response. So uh, Lynn will talk next about uh, the use of clinical data to understand that population reactivity. Um, in this case, I show reactivity in peanut allergic individuals where we know some individuals can react at quite low doses, um, sub um, milligram doses, tenths of milligram or so forth, but others equally allergic could react to the equivalent of a half, maybe even a whole peanut, maybe several peanuts before they react. So there's differences amongst the population. Now if we think about trying to assess cross-reactivity, will we know uh, that something like pea protein uh, might have a similar profile? Um, or perhaps you'll have a different tolerance and you'll see reactivity, but you have to have a higher dose to cause that reactivity. And that's largely unknown at the moment. So we do have to look at that data, but if the allergic population isn't, uh, is small, uh, we don't have a lot of pea allergic individuals, for example, uh, we can't really generate these type of curves. We also can't really generate that comparator uh, unless they're challenged with both sources, perhaps. So peanut and pea, for example, to see that comparison. So do we see, do we have enough data? And currently, uh, we still need to build that database to really compare differences in the context of a legume type cross reactivity. Um, Again, do we see cross-reactivity amongst native sources, or is it that higher protein that triggers that potential cross-reactivity? Or is it co-sensitization? I've developed a new allergen, for example. So we have seen a clinical case report uh, that's now published out of Canada, Montreal, which looked at a small population of peanut and pea allergic individuals that reacted to various pea-based products. And this has really got a lot of press and discussion, uh, certainly in Canada as well as the U.S., thinking about that potential for cross-reactivity. Now, again, keep in mind this is a small population, and it was really an observational population. So with this clinic, six individuals reported reactivity to products that they uh, didn't expect to have reactions to. So they have reacted to pea-based products ranging from um, yogurts to uh, meat analogs to uh, um, various other types of products like shakes and others, chicken, so forth, that they didn't expect that reactivity uh, because many of them could eat peas in their native form, so green peas, perhaps even dried peas, for example. But they had this reaction, some of them mild to rather moderate to perhaps severe reactions upon consumption. Four of these individuals were peanut allergic and reacted, while two of the individuals reacted only to pea. So what this small population is kind of showing us is that there's a diversity in that population. There could be individuals that are uh, having cross-reactivity, but note they had these reactions when consuming the product as a, uh, in the food itself. So it was a very high dose of pea protein. So is that high dose needed to trigger that cross-reactivity? What we don't know also is, are these individuals now just developing pea allergy with the coexisting peanut allergy? So it's not necessarily cross-reactivity, um, but certainly um, co-sensitization. So now a new allergen that they're managing. So there's a lot we don't, don't know. From the analytical side, I think we also have to remember uh, how to manage different allergens in the context of the food industry. So we rely upon ELISA-based methodology, so an immunologically-based method for detection of various allergenic residues that we may look to when we do a changeover, for example. So one critical example of that cross-reactivity that can occur from the side of the analytical perspective is peanut versus pea, those two legume sources, where we had an example 
um, back a few years ago where a laboratory uh, reported a positive on a pea-based pro uh, protein product. Of course, the um, company was quite concerned. Uh, they weren't marketing peanut-free, uh, but they were aware of some peanut-allergic individuals that reacted. They recalled based on these low positives that were reported by the laboratory using the our, our biofarm method. Now, in our biofarm's defense, they clearly indicate potential analytical cross-reactivity of their peanut kit with other legume-based sources, such as pea. So either the external lab didn't recognize that uh, written cross-reactivity, or I can say from the analytical side, uh, we receive a lot of powders, and the client doesn't necessarily tell us what the basis of those various products are. So they would have analyzed and reported, not knowing, again, that it was pea-based product. So again, we have to be quite careful from that analytical perspective on how we may or may not uh, report those results. That communication amongst the, uh, the laboratory and the client is critical. And then just wrapping up, I think there's, in this area of pea protein, uh, there's a lot of emerging questions, but I think this could translate over to novel foods in general. But there's questions on, you know, should we make allergen-free claims? Well, based on what we know, I wouldn't necessarily make a broad allergen-free claim. This is allergen-free. There's someone out there that could react because it does have protein in it. We do know of individuals that have reported reactions to pea-based products. So is it really allergen-free? So maybe refine that consideration for your labeling to think about maybe free from certain protein sources, milk-free, egg-free, for example. Should we consider using a precautionary statement? And I don't know that we have enough information to make an informed decision yet on this. Um, some are considering may not be suitable for, suitable for peanut allergic individuals, but are, do we know that in this context, all peanut allergic individuals are affected. It seems maybe that it's a small subset. So are we re now requiring or uh, relaying to peanut allergic individuals that they should avoid the product when they really don't need to? Again, thinking about the context of that challenge in the avoidance diet that again narrows that quality of life of those individuals. So I think we need to learn more about uh, what we're seeing in this context. Also, should industry consider handling um, pea uh, similar to peanut? And again, I don't think we know, know enough or similar to other priority allergens. Is this just a small subset of isolates and concentrates? Does, it react, does this reactivity uh, go across all of the different isolates and concentrates? It really is probably a, perhaps a dose response. I don't know if we know that. But note, again, we're seeing the reactivity in these very high doses, not these incidental cross-contact potential levels that we'd be looking at. So with that, I will close my discussion. Thank you.